I, I had two graduate assistants, and so it was, it was not as good as without any assistance. No. Yeah, with the real news. I don't know if they got it through. The jealousy was tempted by the recognition of that. So, first thing on the agenda is to announce our alternate proxy representatives. The alternates and proxies that I've received already are Mandy Lopez for Fabio Del Piero, Paula Arai for Stuart Irvine, those are the alternates, proxies, Alicia Latham for Kwame Agyeman, Cindy DiCarlo for Priscilla, Priscilla Allen, Gregory Sills for Kelly Kelly, Chip Delzell for Julia Lede, Chris Barrett for Brian McCann, Weishan Nguyen for Nikki Pace, Nan Walker for Tracy Port, Baba Sarker for Suresh Rai, Mustajab Mirza for La Laura Riggs, and Chris Barrett for Rachel Stevens. Are there any other proxies or alternates for this meeting? Okay. If you haven't signed in in the back, both either guests or faculty senate members, then please do so. And there's also copies of all the uh, items that we need to discuss for today. The next item is for the guests to introduce themselves. And so, Summit, if you would start, introduce yourself, who you with. Sure. Uh, my name is Summit Jen. I am the Director for Information Security for LSU a and uh, I serve as the Chief Information Security Officer for LSU a and I'm John Moore. I'm the Deputy CIO for Information Technology Services. Tom Glenn with the Student Systems Project. Do we have any other guests today? I'm Daniel Bazaar, and I'm Vice President of Okay. And I'm Julie Lefebvre. I'm the Senior Director of Annual Giving at the LSU Foundation. Any other guests? All right, thank you. Susanna, do we have anybody registered for public comment? Okay. Uh, the next item is to consider our August 29th, 2018 minutes. And as you'll note, uh, we've tried to just give the highlights rather than the word-by-word -word narrative. The word-by-word -word narrative will be on our new website as soon as we open it up. Probably by the end of next week, we want to make sure we've got all the materials off the old website that we need for the new one. And obviously, then the videos will be available there also. So do I hear a motion to accept the minutes with any minor changes, typos, corrections, grammar, that type of thing will be later? Yes. Okay, we have a motion. Do I see a second? Kathy seconds. So now the floor is open for discussion. Are there changes to the minutes? Hearing no comments, then I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of accepting the minutes with any minor corrections to be made later, say aye. Uh, all opposed, no. Any abstentions? All right, thank you. Um, the next item is my report. Senators uh, who were not here the, the last meeting due to a, a glitch, glitch and miscommunication between me and science. Okay. Now I don't know how. <laughs> I knew I knew there was a reason why I invited the IT people here. Today. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Um, so we have the new senators from uh, Art Design. Humanities and Social Sciences Law Center and from Science, and so we welcome them. I failed to mention last meeting, some of you discovered by necessity and others because you wanted, 
the restrooms are through that door and all the way at the end of the hall or if you're sitting in the back and you don't want everybody to know where you're going you can walk all the way around and still get to them past the elevators okay um, so I said we would have a revised Faculty Senate website. Susanna has got it almost ready to go. And then because we're not sure that we can have both available, we want to make sure that our old website is, uh, the information is available. So we're obtaining a large enough hard drive so we can download all of that information uh, so that we don't have any problems on that. Last time we talked about getting prices and quotes for faculty senate apparel, and so Suzanne is also doing that so that we'll at least have that available and then we can decide yes we do or don't and who wants to buy or not buy. Building coordinator lists are on that website, uh, bc.lsu.edu. Some of you have requested that information. We also wanted to make sure that you knew where the Administrative Process Improvement Committee website was to file any complaints about an administrative process, whether it's streamlining the process, whether it's the amount of time it takes to get a form processed, or whatever it happens to be. And because of uh, our old buddy Shorts Travel and all the <laughs> nice things that most of us have to say about them, we also have uh, two different sections, one for a survey and one for any travel difficulties that you might encounter. Please, please use that because we want documentation of the travel so that at some point in time we can make a strong case for increased autonomy in that regard. The search for the registrar has concluded. Uh, Dr. Koch served as faculty representative on that committee. I'm not sure yet whether they have made an offer, but that will become public as soon as they make an offer to the chosen candidate. Um, search for provost is ongoing, and I've noticed that Dr. Alexander has come, so welcome Dr. Alexander. And he has assembled our committee, and <coughs> the announcement has been sent out, circulated to all the important aspects. Uh, so we'll see what kind of candidates we have come in for that. The candidate interviews for Associate Vice President for Public Safety will conclude on Monday, and the Faculty Senate Executive Committee has been involved in those aspects so far, and most of the committee agrees. We have two very worthy candidates. If the third candidate comes in and is uh, as, has the same credentials and the same uh, abilities, then that will be one of the hard choices that we have. Just to refresh your memory, that Associate Vice President for Public Safety will be in the Office of Finance and Administration, but they will eventually coordinate public safety across all the campuses. So they'll start with the AM campus first, help us solve some of our difficulties coordinate things like traffic and safety with the police department, with uh, environmental health and safety. And once that's accomplished, then they'll be working with the other public safety units on the other campuses. Uh, obviously, of immediate concern is game day traffic and how we handle that, tailgating, how we handle that. So there's <laughs> lots of coordination that, that uh, will occur under that scenario. We believe we are finalizing our animal and society forum, and in that regard, it will be next spring. We've not set the final date. It will be somewhere around the third week in February. We've contacted the keynote speaker. We do have the funding that we need, uh, compliments of the provost's office and our faculty senate budget and the vet school of veterinary medicine. So we'll be sending out more announcements about that. Uh, it's intended to be a campus-wide, community-type forum. Uh, in that regard, we also have a Beyond the Ballot, and I talked about that last time. <coughs> We're almost finalizing the agenda for that two-day meeting, and so in that regard, that will be in regards to elections, turning out voters, what issues are important to voters, and those type aspects. 
you received a form if you picked it up about faculty training, seminars, and workshops. These are some of the topics that we believe some faculty might be interested in. So please fill that out. Put a check mark in whatever slot fits. And if you think for sabbaticals, how to, and the different types that are available, then if you don't have any interest, put a check there. But if you say, oh yeah, I might be interested, and my colleagues most certainly would be, put checks in those appropriate slots. And there's a space at the bottom if you've got other seminars, training, etc., that you think faculty should be involved in, then by all means put that down. Right now, the accessibility for online uh, materials, we're negotiating with strategic communications on who's going to give the training and how fast that training is going to occur for faculty members. That's why it's not on there because we're already in the midst of that and the other aspect will be on Moodle depending upon how fast they make progress with Moodle rooms and those type aspects. So are there any questions about that and what we're actually asking for? Yes? You, you want us to turn this form right now? No, you can turn it at the end of the meeting. Right the end of the meeting. Yeah. And you can either leave it in place or put it at the back or at the close of the meeting, wave your hand and I'll come get it or Susanna will get it. Yes. We're pretty, that's a good question. Uh, faculty adjudication committee. There's also a sheet for nominations for committees. So I'm still looking for candidates. The first two are probably, in some aspects, the most important and most urgent. We do want to get the faculty adjudication committee back and up and running. Some of you have very graciously nominated yourself or your colleagues. If you want to nominate yourself or a colleague, that's why there's an open slot there for you to do that. And also then we're looking for administrative <coughs> process improvement committee members. That one has to be a faculty senator because that's the way the committee is set up. So I need one of you to volunteer for that. Fabio Del De Perro is our executive committee representative. He couldn't be here today. And Mike Russo is the faculty at large representative. So because it's set up, we have a faculty senate, executive committee member, a faculty senator, which is now vacant, and I need a slot, a person to fill that slot, and then the third is a general faculty member. That committee meets on a monthly basis, and they schedule around your schedule when everybody can meet. They look then at all the complaints that come into the APIC website and just determine which office is most appropriate to handle that and then make sure that indeed it does get an answer back to the person who made the complaint if they identify themselves. I failed to point out that the APIC website can be totally anonymous. You can just say, Ken McMillan's office sucks. <laughs> and it'll come to me and I won't be able to respond except in, well, I'm doing the best I can do. So it can be anonymous or you can put down your name so you automatically will get a response within a day or two. And that committee has functioned really well. Um, I think Sandy Gilliam is still, uh, I know that Tyler is chairing that committee and Jane now is chairing, Dr. Cassidy is chairing that committee and they've been as diligent about making sure that responses are given as when the committee was set up four years ago. Um, I'm also looking for faculty liaisons with staff senate and student government between the staff senate president, uh, Tammy Milliken, and student government president, Stuart Lockett. The three of us, we've done some things together and we're trying to build more community among our respective government <coughs> groups so that we can, again, continue to work on those aspects that affect all of us. Obviously, not all of the student issues affect faculty and vice versa, and also with staff, but we're trying to coordinate some of those activities on which we have mutual interest. The Organization's Relief Fund. Uh, Ali, I thought I saw Ali, he's already volunteered for that committee. That committee determines, they have a, 
they have a set amount of money for organizations, student organizations and students who are going to be traveling on university uh, activities but for which they don't have any funds or they're running in the spring short of funds, that relief committee then determines what are appropriate levels of funds and what are appropriate events to provide that additional funding. So it's kind of a supplemental to uh, a normal organization's budget and travel or uh, activities, whatever. Parking Appeals Committee, I need a couple of members for that. Some of you might be in need of that sometime during the year. Uh, so that's an important committee. And then last but not least, uh, I'm still soliciting names for fa faculty athletic representative. You'll notice that I've said it has to be a senior faculty member. It doesn't absolutely have to be a full faculty member, although we would prefer that, but it has to be somebody that's been around for a while because that person represents the university to NCAA and SEC. So we're looking for somebody who can devote up to five to seven hours a week, depending upon the week, and there is a fair amount of travel, so we're looking for the right individual to fill that slot. Um, Bill DeMastis has been our most recent uh, faculty athletic representative, and so that's why I sent you the job description. He did a very good job of explaining this is what the faculty athletic representative does. There's some responsibilities. Obviously, it's a flexible time because when you're away for three or four day NCAA meetings, then it's like going to a conference or whatever. So, Dr. Alexander, would you like to add any comments to that since the faculty senate will nominate three or more individuals, but his office will actually pick who that representative is going to be. Well, that, that representative is, actually does a lot with us and, and for us. And as you know, I have intercollegiate athletics, and Bill has been, done a great job, and we hate to see Bill step down from that position, but he's well respected throughout the country and, and in the SEC and in the NCAA. Uh, but that person, the person needs to have a balanced view of athletics, and that means pro and con understanding that a lot of the issues that Bill come across his desk um, are issues that you, you, you might read about in a newspaper. Uh, but also with everything brewing right now in intercollegiate athletics from the O'Bannon case to that could go all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, likeness and image for EA Sports, there's a lot of stuff out there that's going on right now that throws intercollegiate athletics into a real big question mark. So this is a very important position for us uh, as we go forward, but because of all the national national issues associated with intercollegiate athletics and intercollegiate sports. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Alexander about that? If you note, we haven't, except for a few incidences that haven't been with the academic side of athletics, we haven't had any difficulties for how many years, Kevin? So that's one of the major roles of the faculty uh, athletic representative is to make sure that our compliance office and our president's office and the faculty senate and the athletic department are all in sync on what our student athletes need to do in the classroom and academics one, to be eligible, but two, also so they just participate and don't cause any difficulties. So the three biggest issues athletically really don't have to do with academics. It's Michigan State, Ohio State, and the University of Maryland. But the big one before that was Chapel Hill. And that one has tarnished UNC Chapel Hill. And they're still living with the aftermath of a strictly academic issue that had been going on for about 10 years. Our, our, our student athletes understand what it means to be a student first and an athlete second. <laughs> and yet we're still successful in most all of our sports. So that speaks pretty highly of our institution and the people that we have in all of those representative uh, places. Some of my meetings, as I said earlier, uh, Dr. Milliken, or excuse me, Tammy Milliken and Stuart Lockett and I have met along with Clay Bennett. Uh, with Clay Benton, on commencement activities, 
we want to have a little bit more faculty involvement, more staff involvement, and to make it a little bit more meaningful, at least the main ceremony for those attendees. Now it's turned into more of a graduate uh, PhD degree granting ceremony and we want to bring back a little bit more so that undergraduates, one, are encouraged but also feel welcome to attend along with their parents. And so we're working with uh, actually Arsenault and the President's Office to see what we can do to tweak the commencement activities a little for fall and then see what we actually really need to do uh, if there are any major changes in the spring. So any ideas that you have, they're just two sacred things. One is we will have a main ceremony, and two, those graduates like to get the diploma at the time of the ceremony. And in that regard, LSU is fairly unique among most universities who do mail them out now. And so in that regard, if you can figure out a way that we can easily get the diplomas and every student, single student could walk across the stage, we're open to any and all suggestions that we'll consider them pretty seriously. Um, faculty Senate Executive Committee, some of us, as long as representatives across the university are working on the Faculty 360 project, that obviously is the digital measures, the evaluation, and annual report process. I don't want to hear any bad things or make a progress. we still got a long ways to go. So in that aspect, we're trying to streamline, we're trying to synchronize, we're trying to coordinate, and things like that just take time when you've got lots of disparate departments who want to use that information for many different purposes. Uh, we had the Association of Louisiana Faculty Senates, uh, and jointly with American Association of University Professors, LSU, uh, Louisiana chapter on September 8th. We had that at LSU Alexandria, and we are fortunate to have uh, Dr. Kim hunter Reed, who's our new commissioner of higher education, come and speak to us. And she was quite candid about some of the things that the Board of Regents is doing right and some of the things that they're going to tweak in the next, uh, next few months. And so in that regard, we were pretty satisfied that she is going to be a good candidate and a good strong advocate for higher education. Uh, Jose Avilas will come in a few minutes, so I don't want to say too much about uh, our admissions holistic <coughs> standards. It's received lots of press, probably undue press. So I'll just tell you right now, we're not lowering standards. What we're doing is students who don't meet our minimum standards, we're taking a second look at are there extenuating circumstances on why they may have a 21 instead of 22, or they don't have the grade point that we would expect, or in some cases, yeah, they haven't met the Louisiana core because out-of-state students don't have to meet our Louisiana core to graduate. Yet, if a student has a 30 and a 4.3 grade point average and they're missing one course, we don't want that student to come. So those are some of the aspects that the paper and the media still haven't picked up on. I don't understand why it's so hard for them to get the facts straight, but they seem to have difficulties in doing that. So as a result, we did meet over in the president's office and discuss some of these differences in how the media is portraying it versus what actually is going on. And then Jose will be here. He's coming in to Baton Rouge from another meeting. Uh, so we're probably, oh, Jose, you're here. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I wonder why you're out of breath. <laughs> uh, so he'll be here uh, speaking to us in just a minute. Uh, last but not least, uh, I said that we interviewed with the Associate Vice President for Public Safety candidates, and we think that they are uh, going to be working really well for us. So with that, I'll conclude. Are there any questions? Okay, then... Uh, I've also met with Interim Provost Haney uh, on several occasions. I did meet with Caleb Green, and some of you saw my comments where I expressed uh, exactly what I said about the uh, 
admission standards and what we're doing with holistic review. Um, obviously, I have met with the steering committee for a presidential symposium beyond the ballot. That's uh, we met on September 14th. That is scheduled for October 29th and 30th. And then yesterday, take that. Yeah, yesterday I did meet with CTO Ballinger uh, and. Mr. Jane will talk about some of the topics we talked about, but more or less we talked about what strategic plan that they're going to develop their annual report for this past year, and uh, so they'll be making that public in just a few weeks. Um, at our October Faculty Senate meeting, Dr. Lee will be here to talk about online accessibility requirements and some aspects of the training that will be available uh, for faculty members. We'll have a student modernization project update by Mr. by Dr. Glenn, and we'll also uh, have Stephen Beck from ORED talk to us uh, on some of the latest developments on research and economic development. So with that, I will close and summon. No, let, let's go with Jose. We'll follow the order. So Jose, if you're ready, then uh, we'll let you talk to us about the aspects of uh, I have a question about that last slide. Is our meeting on the 20th or the 12th? One second. What? <laughs> October 22nd is a Saturday. It's the 22nd. 22nd. It's the 22nd. Okay. Yes, 22nd. Thanks for catching that. You, you get an A minus for today. <laughs> yes, you can. Good afternoon. Um, yes, my name is uh, Jose Villas. I'm Vice President of Enrollment here at LSU. I've just completed my, uh, my first cycle here with the team, and I have um, our Director of Admissions, Mr. Danny Barrow, here in the back, who um, has really been spearheading a lot of the execution of the strategy here um, at LSU. And you're right, uh, President, I've been running around with our President and President of LSU for the last two days up at Shreveport, kind of um, working through some of the stories and some of the interest and intrigue around holistic missions um, and the work that we've done. You know, I, I, this is my eighth institution that I've served very purposely, so I've served um, the most selective school in the country all the way through a community college. And my leadership roles for the last, um, this now being the third, have been flagship institutions. And so it's a great honor to, to serve this community and to do the work of serving students here at LSU and in the state of Louisiana. And, and frankly, the work that we've done this year has probably been the most impactful that I've experienced in my, in my career in terms of the direct impact to students and to a community. And, and certainly the outcomes and results have been simply remarkable in ways that probably are unmatched in, in any of the other campaigns that I've, I've, uh, I've been a part of. So I figured what we would talk about this, uh, this afternoon is really kind of giving you the year in review <laughs> as, as best we can and, and really do it from a perspective of really the, the hot topic of, of the day, which is starting with holistic admissions. And in some ways, I'm kind of um, not necessarily, I mean, one thing that is important to know is that holistic admissions of this year was one of thousands of different things that we had to, 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 to move in the operation of recruitment and admissions in order to achieve the kind of results that we achieved for this community this year. It's not the singular, and I'm hesitant, even in, in the press have been saying, I'm not so sure that holistic review in itself is responsible for the outcomes. It's one of many changes, pretty significant changes that we, we made this year in order to do the work that was required of this institution. But I'll start with, with looking at it through the lens of holistic review and, and then we'll go deeper into it. So to, to just start, right, I mean, 
when I got here last, last time this year, I spent the first 90 days really benchmarking everything that we were doing in, in the recruitment of the class, in, in admission specifically, and very squarely looking at um, the review of applicants and, and certainly understanding very early on that we were just not consistent with the national landscape of how classes are composed at institutions across the country. And so, real quickly, uh, at the time, uh, Provost Kubek had made me aware of the faculty resolution, faculty senate resolution, that really allowed us to really think about how do we shift and, and really meeting the burden of, of what the institution wanted to do way back in 2006. At the time, we didn't have the technology and perhaps even the, the, the capacity in terms of re human resources within the operation to, to, to accomplish the kind of change that, that would require. But in truth, we did have holistic review present. It's not necessarily new, right? So every student who did not meet the benchmark of the 22 and 3.0 were in fact um, given the opportunity to appeal their process or their decision and to go through a process um, through a faculty committee mixed with admission folks to re-review that, that applicant um, with new information that most certainly was not improving the 22 and 3.0. It was a set of new information beyond the ACT and GPA to make the case um, to overturn the decision. So one of the things that really we did this year was strategically, we just know. We just know that if we tell a student on, at the front door that they are not admitted, for them to go through the measured steps then to re-appeal that process and go through yet another hurdle of trying to make their case for admission, that student really has to love LSU to do all that. And I would say the most qualified students in, in, the, in, in, the, in the educational pipeline most certainly will just write us off. Won't, won't do that. They have too many other choices. At this point in time, students, are, students in, in, in the college search process are applying to anywhere between eight to 12 schools. It most certainly is um, a seller's market. It's not, uh, or a buyer's market. It's not necessarily a seller's market at this point. There are so many institutions competing for a shrinking margin of students. And you know, in some cases, like this year with the class that we set, most certainly, when you look at our partners across the SEC, in fact, only three SEC institutions this year have reported that they increased enrollment. Every other SEC institution declined or remained flat. The majority of them declined compared to the previous year. So the fact that we won out, especially with non-resident students, means that some other institutions in the SEC did not make headcount for the classes they were expecting. So we have to do everything we can strategically to make sure that we're competitively positioning LSU in a way that students in the end can look at, at their choices and see themselves at LSU. So, so operationalizing holistic review by virtue of that, that resolution was critically important. So really what has, has, has holistic review done for us? Well, again, interesting how it's being portrayed, right? That we have lessened the standard. Anywhere else in the country, holistic review is viewed as the most rigorous review process available in college admissions. So I say we have enhanced the rigor, the quality, and the depth of our assessment. We have gone from looking at just two metrics to now looking at a full application in the totality of what a student is. Another thing is that we really have looked at, and this again, this comes from what, what um, the UC system found when they went to a comprehensive review back in the late 90s, early 2000s, but really this idea of expanding and deepening the, the, the conception of merit. And really, what does that mean? Well, holistic review, if you look at the research, for the last 40 years has identified that there's so much more that matters in the selection of students than just a board score and just an ACT. In fact, the research tells us that the highest correlation to student success exists, the highest correlation, the strongest assessment exists when you take into account high school grade point average, board scores, student background, and the set of non-cognitive, non-academic characteristics that are evidenced in the 40 years of research that directly correlate positively with student success. If you can achieve that kind of robust assessment, your assessment of the entering class is the strongest and is based on evidence-based um, set of criteria. 
And then, really, what Holistic Review also allowed us in this year to do is really to, to find access, to look for ways in which we can include students throughout the eligibility pool that really, through a comprehensive review and looking at them in their context, allowed us to really fully understand who they were in totality. This is what Holistic Review allowed us to do in this year. Far greater than what we were doing in previous cycles, where we were really doing the initial review on a spreadsheet, looking at GPA and ACT, never even opening up the application to read, to find out anything else about that student. My point across and what I've been saying is, not all GPAs are created equal. I've been doing college admissions for 20 years. I can tell you that if you just tell me you have a 3.0, that means very little to me. I need to understand deeper what that 3.0 is made up of. And I need to understand what and how your grades have trended over time to more fully understand the quality of who you are as a student. We'll talk about that in a second. So what has Holistic Review really given us in terms of the impact? Well, virtually on every measure of academic excellence, the fall 2018 class that's coming in is strong, has stronger qualifications than any other previous class in LSU history. Phenomenal. We're starting to look at layers of data, and, data, and at every turn we're saying, wow, we're outperforming anything the institution has ever done in terms of the depth of the, of, of the data, the layers of the data that we're seeing in this class. Proportions of the admitted class that historically have had less access to LSU, students who are low income, students who are first gen, coming from rural communities, low performing schools, or other historically underrepresented groups, I always term them as hugs, Hugs are historically underrepresented groups have significantly improved. We've included a broader scope of students, especially right here in our home state. And the data really is showing now that we have attracted and enrolled more high achieving students in this cycle. We haven't, in some, when we look at cycles over the last five years, we're not even close. This year's class just attracted a stronger group of students at the top end if you're just looking at the traditional metrics. So we're going to look at a little bit of, of these data slides here. So here are the, the highlights of the class, right? We crested over, I mean, we, we really, the highest set of applications LSU ever attracted was around 19,000. <coughs> maybe, maybe that's a little high, too. Um, the previous year we were at 17,000. This year we're over 24,000, the largest applicant pool in LSU history. It's the largest number of non-resident students ever to apply to LSU. The largest number of honors applications and enrolled to think about a year ago we had probably about 530 or so honor students this year we're about 750 honor students coming in the honors class is more is 80 percent more diverse than last year's class with a stronger act and a stronger grade point average than last year's class so again everything that matters in putting together that community we knocked out the park 48% of the applicants this year identify themselves as students of color, phenomenal feat for us. And when you look at the low income students, 27% of the class this year were Pell eligible students or granted the Pell, the Pell grant, which means that really these are the students that really have had significant struggles and it's the highest percentage of Pell eligibility in, in any class we've ever brought. But we had a 57% increase <laughs> in students who are Pell, Pell eligible who have an ACT 30 or above. Colleagues, what I'm telling you is it, with the, it, the most elite environments in the country, their entire agenda right now in terms of achieving diversity is trying to find a low-income student that is high achieving. We improved that metric from last year to this year by 57% more students. And of course, the final enrollment is actually IR is going to say 58-12. I'm saying 58-18. They can't take six students from me. But <laughs> IR is going to debate with me. They, they say 58-18. Uh, they say 58-12 is, is the final number for them. So that's the overall class highlights. This is probably a little hard to see, maybe not so much up here. But this kind of just gives you the point, the, the data of where we are with, with some of the application numbers I mentioned. I've highlighted the non-resident group here going from 832 to 1212. <laughs> 45% more non-residents, 12, uh, nearly 13% more residents. We went from 4,000 to uh, 4,600 um, resident students. And again, when you look at, look at the enrolled ACT, flat. Again, I can just tell you that having done 
this work for the last 20 years, and even as I talk to colleagues around the country, and say we increased the class by 900 students, naturally the most knee-jerk reaction is, well, if you're going to increase the class by 900 students, you're going to sacrifice quality. Our metrics aren't showing that. In fact, we have a slightly, slightly stronger GPA. Slightly. <coughs> flat. With 900 more students, we matched the highest average quality of an incoming class, which is the ACT 26 that LSU has had historically. That's, again, just a phenomenal feat for this community. When you look at it from the diversity perspective, again, this has been talked a lot about, but you see that we have 46% more students who are historically under, in a historically underrepresented subgroups, significant gains, when you think about where we are with African, 51% more African Americans, 38% more Hispanic students, 46% more Asian. Again, just a very diverse community of students that we've attracted from all over the country to uh, that ultimately chose LSU. This is what it looks like by college. And when you look at who's led the way here, right? And raw number of science here had, went from 884 to 1106. 222 more students, go science, phenomenal, right? HSS, 142 more students, and business, 119 more students. But we had growth everywhere. We can do better with Coast, and we know that. We've been talking to Chris and, and, and his staff, Dean Delia. Um, you know, they have a small, a small number in there, but I hate to see a negative on any page, right? I think we can do better there, and we need to do better there. When you look at the quality bands, so again, here's the case in point. When you look at the top end of the pool, we exceeded, if you're just looking at ACT metrics, we exceeded the, the previous year in terms of the best students in the funnel. In fact, having 30% more students who have a 31 or higher ACT. Again, this is not hard, this is not easy to do, I was to say it's not hard to do, and Danny was going to strangle me. This is not, not something that's easy to do, right? I mean, at this level, uh, above 30, um, again, every institution is looking to squeeze out headcount ones and twos and threes at a time. To say that we increased by 133 students, that's, that's just not, not common. When you look at historically underrepresented students by quality, and you look at how we look at this, just about every one of these bands. Again, these are the most sought after students in the country. You know, we, we have an example of a student who is an African American female who's in, in the STEM area here who has an ACT 30 from Donaldsonville, Pell eligible. Has all the markers on anybody's applicant pool, she would be somebody that's highlighted and saying, that we gotta win out on this one. She, won, uh, she uh, had a full ride to Notre Dame, could have gone to Notre Dame, but decided to come to LSU in the final analysis. In the final hours, April 30th, right before we, she had to finalize her decision, chose LSU over another day. We had another student that was coming from, from Atlanta, also African-American female, who I didn't realize, but when we got here during Welcome Week, Banglebound, came up to me at convocation, was like, hey, Dr. A, remember me from Atlanta? I decided LSU. I said, yeah, I remember you had a competitive set. She had gotten admitted to Georgia Tech, TCU, Berkeley, and us from Atlanta, in the end, said, chose LSU. And again, her point, and I'll talk a little bit about this too, like what led to these, these, these dramatic results. One of the key differences was, this year, I wanted to make sure that when we were leading in our conversation, our marketing pieces, our outreach, were focused very squarely on two very important messages. Number one, the academic reputation of the institution. The number one reason why students report nationally that they choose ultimately the college they choose is because of their perceived, their perception of the academic re reputation of the place that they chose ultimately. Academic reputation is the number one driver for ultimate choice. When I look at what we were doing over the last three years, we were talking a lot about how wonderful this place is in terms of outside of the classroom experiences, in that stadium right across the street every Saturday, how phenomenal that experience is. We were, we were highlighting these things. You know, the, the brand, the athletic brand, and that's, that's great. We don't want to, to move away from that. 
but we want to make sure we're leading with the academic message that when you look at LSU and you put a side-by-side -side with the other flagships across the country and you see the faculty that we attract and the kind of research that our faculty are doing, that we measure up with these other institutions across the country, that, that we are in that class of institution. <laughs> and ultimately, that student from Atlanta said that's the reason why she chose us. That because when she went out to Atlanta, she, she loved the reception. We had a reception for admitted students. And she felt that it was such a warm, inviting place and, and a community where she could see herself, but her mom wanted to do her to, to line us up side by side with Georgia Tech, Berkeley, TCU, and in the final analysis she thought, what you guys are doing at LSU measured up. So I wanted to come to LSU. That's the kind of stories that we keep hearing about this class. 43% more students of color who are 25 or higher on the ACT. Again, great work. When you look at the Pell eligible groups, right, this is students that are the low income groups, and again, looking at the top end of the pool, 164 more students choosing us. In fact, we have a 57% gain of students that are third, ACT 30 or higher who are Pell eligible. So, again, just work that is just, it's just not, it's, it's probably never, it's, I don't know if it's ever going to happen again in my career. It was just phenomenal growth, you know, when you think about some of the successes in this class. Look at it from the perspective of in-state, what we did in-state, again, I, I heard very early on last year the challenges we've had down in New Orleans and, and really getting students ultimately to choose us. We really won out just about everywhere. We need to do better in Alexandria, we need to do better in Lake Charles. Lake Charles, we had an admitted student reception that was standing room only out in the Golden Nugget. Um, again, we, we can do better in those markets. Um, we have to do better. Shreveport, we were just up there, like I said, over the last two days. And just love sharing with the community up there that you have 70% more students coming from Shreveport with a, their average student coming out, I just know this because we spent two days there, the average GPA of students coming from Shreveport is 3.8. The average ACT this year is 29 compared to 26 last year. So again, every time we're looking a layer deeper at the data, we're just seeing that the quality metrics of the class are just stronger than ever. So for us to sit, or, or for, for the public to, to characterize this as a lesson in quality, it's not the case. It's not, it's not what's happening here. The national enrollment, again, here's where we had to do a lot of work, but we're very proud of the work in Texas, 44% more students. I was sitting right next to Texas A&M at the SEC meetings where they were, you know, they're, they're kind of getting their, their class numbers in at the time, it was in May, and they were kind of a little behind the previous year, and they were saying Houston hurt us because the hurricane had come through Houston, and you know, we struggled with, with what happens with families being displaced. Well, my point, you know, back to the staff was, we dealt with the same circumstance. Houston is our second biggest market. New Orleans, by zip code, New Orleans is the biggest. Houston's number two. We had the same circumstance dealing with the, the tragic event of the, of the hurricane last year, but still, we had a significant growth in Houston. Students choosing us. And so my point, again, not necessarily, I don't want to tell Texas A&M this, but the point is, yeah, you struggled. I don't think it was because of a hurricane. It's because we ended up taking more students than what we typically do at LSU. And, you know, ultimately students can only choose one place, right? So some, some win and some lose. Florida there, 84, 85% more students in Florida. We did some work up in, in the Northeast. So when you see, like, D.C. Metro, again, huge growth is a new market for us. 152% more students there. Look at New York here, again. Great, a great start in, in these areas. New, new Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York are brand new markets where we're, we're just treading very carefully there because the Northeast is really declining in terms of total um, high school graduate numbers, graduation numbers, so we're, we're a little careful there, but there's still a high mobility rate. Those students have means and they're likely to leave their home states. So we think we can do some work in those areas in, in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania. But you just got to be a little careful there because the, the, the overall data tells us those markets are really in sharp decline. So what were the changes? The first thing I will say, and the things I really originally had, had um, highlighted in red <coughs> were data, 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 data. Our work in admissions and recruiting a class in this day and age is all governed by the use of big data. If you're not using predictive analytics, if not, you're not using external sources from the college board, from consulting firms that can give you good enough 
zip code level data, you're probably not going to fare well in this era of, of recruiting a class. This, this environment previous to this year just was, was in a deficit in that area. There's no question that the big change for us was, was the incorporation of using and making decisions that were deeply data um, informed and data driven. Started with the search by doing a whole regression model at the top end of the funnel, instead of just buying names from every college source like ACT and College Board and others, that's what we were doing historically. What we did this year was we took 10 years of data, ran regression analysis on what kind of students really end up choosing LSU in the end, what are the markers of students like that, and then applied it to the national databases and said, these are the kinds of students with these markers that we want to purchase. We're gonna seed the list with students who have a propensity to apply and a propensity to enroll. That set the motion for this year's recruiting class in a way that gave us a chance to win. We used travel and travel, our travel processes were all outlined by data using this, this service called EPS or Enrollment Planning Service that tells us at a zip code level students' mobility rate, students' family income, students' accomplishments, and score bands based on ACT and SATs. So we were going out of state, not just to Texas or Houston or Dallas, but we were getting much more micro saying, we want to go to these sets of high schools and these zip codes because there's fertile ground for students to actually leave the state and choose a place like LSU. So there's a lot there. I won't go through all of them. I mentioned the academic reputation as the message. You know, again, we wanted to make sure that the audience heard us very loud and clear that we are in the group of the national flagship institutions. And among that, that set of 50 institutions sit a handful, about 17 institutions, that are land grant, sea grant, space grant status institutions. 17 out of 4,000 institutions. That robust portfolio, the, the depth and breadth of that portfolio, attracts talented folks like you, faculty from all over the world. Who are the folks who are going to be teaching you on this campus? That's a significant difference than going to another, especially in-state option. But certainly, when you look at us across the board, we wanted to lead with a very, very strong and clear academic message. And everything from that point on was from the academic reputation perspective, or value proposition. This is the things that we did. Holistic review is, again, probably was talked about right now most. So let me just talk a little bit more about this. <coughs> again, holistic review is not new. It's been around now for about 40 years. In, in, in the public sphere, probably the last 20, 25 years. But it's what the research identifies as what you should, how you should be selecting your, your classes based on everything that you understand. That's everything we understand in the research around college selection. These two kind of drive some of that, right? We know that we have to find ways in which we measure talent that's more broad than just the two metrics. And we certainly understand that when we start looking at just two metrics, we start suppressing the participation of students in groups that don't fully really have enough information to engage at a high level in the college search process. This is what I said earlier, right? That the research tells us that the highest correlation of student success exists when SES, which is socioeconomic status or student background, high school grade point average, board scores are evaluated along with non-cognitive variables that are identified in the research. Very, very clear, right? That the more narrow you get, even the testing agencies at this point, ACT has since released numerous, since 2004, numerous studies the researchers here were commissioned by the ACT. So even the testing agencies at this point are saying, there's just so much more about what we understand related to student success than to just narrowly focus on grade point average and board score as two metrics. So how did we do it? Well, again, this isn't fuzzy stuff, right? And this isn't new, this is best practices. So the first thing is an in-depth of a college, of a high school transcript. I fundamentally just believe that a 3.0 is just not created equal. 3.0 tells me very little. So the first thing we wanted to see in the student's transcript is what was available in your home environment, challenge towards the curriculum, what was available in your home environment versus what did you take? 
That challenge towards the curriculum is a standard way to start a review of a transcript in any admission process. We want to see students who accept rigor, who step up to rigor, whatever the highest level of rigor is available in your high school. And we want to see students that are accepting rigor in the areas that they're planning to study. So in other words, if you're looking to study engineering, you should have exhausted your math and science lines in high school. If you have AP math, IB math, if you have those options for you available in your high school environment and you're interested in studying engineering, you should have exhausted that highest level of rigor in your high school environment. The challenge towards the curriculum is a standard, standard way to start the evaluation of a transcript. Grade trends. Again, 3.0 tells me very little about true potential. Sure, you could have achieved a 3.0. Maybe you fell flat. You know, I keep saying, here in Baton Rouge, we still have a cohort of students that are dealing with the floods that just came through, right, a short time ago. Some of these students were displaced. Some of these students had interruptions in their high school environments. And we're just holding all students to 3.0 and saying your talent is measured on that bar and not willing to take into account the fact that you've gone through some pretty catastrophic situations in your life. For us, we want to look at the grade trends. Are students really, are, is there something that we can understand by a deeper review? If you don't have that 3.0, is there something that we can understand when we do a deeper review? Are your grades going up? Are they getting stronger? Are they going down, which is not good and we don't want to see? Or is, it, is there something that we need to understand because your grade trends are mixed? Like an unfortunate situation that I just described. Senior year schedule. The research is very clear about this. Senior year in terms of correlation of student success. That senior year course load in the research has been over and over consistently pointed to as critically important. The rigor of that senior year matters in terms of your success in a college environment. So if you decide to go off to a field experience and take half a day in your senior year, instead of taking a full seven courses and stepping up to the highest levels of AP, IB, honors, whatever that highest level of rigor is in your home environment, that matters. The research bears that out. So again, just because you have a 3.0 does not tell us enough, right? And then preparation for major area of study. Again, if you're looking to be in a science-based area, then we need to see the strength of curriculum in that area. The same is true for writing or any other area that you want to study. Your strength in course selection should mirror what you're saying you're interested in studying. So that was the first thing we did. The second thing is a qualitative review of essays and recommendations. Again, I'm not interested in reading a good story. Um, essays and recommendations oftentimes are characterized this way. When you look at the institutions that have even moved to test optional, there's nearly a thousand institutions that have moved and become test optional. So don't even use the exam anymore. And their success metrics have either stayed steady or have increased. They're not declining. The core of their evaluation is based on this research, these non-academic variables. So again, if you're not at a 22 and 3.0, I'm, I'm not looking for a good story or explanation, but I am looking for these things, right? 40 years of research, and these non-academic variables, the seminal researcher there is Bill Sedlicek from Maryland who's really kind of helped outline for admission offices across the country. What are the things we should be looking for? Well, now these variables over the last 40 years have been optimized in practice and have been used broadly across the country to aid in selection of students based on characteristics of a student portfolio that directly correlate with success in a college environment. These are the, the, the research evidence characteristics that are put out there. Again, I won't go through all of these. All of these we can measure for. In fact, when we ask for students to submit supplemental essays or recommendations because we want to know more, we're asking questions that align with these variables. We're not asking for just an explanation, but we're asking questions that prompt us to be able to assess students based on the evidence of these characteristics. And then the newest research is GRIT. That's what most, if you kind of listen to any, anyone talk about college admissions right now, GRIT is the trendy research. And GRIT comes out of the Bill Sutherland body of literature, but in some ways, again, it's more narrow in some ways, but it's the thing that most people are talking about. But it is this idea of a student on this campus 
who, who gets up every single day and is just going to stick to it, right? Is not just going to give in because things have gone too hard, or is not going to just fold because they've gotten knocked down, they got their D or C minus on an on exam. They're just going to get up again tomorrow and continue to fight through that experience. That grittiness, again, in the research is showing that that grittiness is more important to identify even than talent. In fact, the, the research, again, I challenge you to look at Duckworth's um, studies, but she's finding that there's even some inverse relationship between IQ and grit. The important thing to note is that we have not at all, holistic review is not saying in our version of holistic review, we are not de-emphasizing ACT or GPA. We are not taking that off the table. We are not talking about being test optional. None of that. Holistic review is, for me, a comprehensive review of every factor you can possibly get to assess students in their totality based on their experiences as a student. So for me, every piece of, of evidence in an application is additive. It's not something that is truly, a, as a single indicator, punitive. Not one single thing, I think, in itself is punitive. But in holistic review, you're looking for as many factors as you possibly can have to assess a student, not taking them away, right? The strongest assessment, as the research says, exists when all those things are put into the model together. So quality control, the, co the composing and shaping of the class for, for LSU. Again, there's, it's not by accident that we ended up at an ACT 26, mirroring last year's ACT. On a daily basis, we have dashboards that are looking at how many students we're admitting and what subsets of students are we admitting where, by major, by college, by subgroup, in-state, out-of-state, SES. We're tracking this on a daily basis. So the first reader in our process, everything I just described in terms of the, the deep dive into the high school transcript and look for non-academic variables and non-cognitive variables, the first reader does all that. They do it based on the region that they recruit. So if I'm assigned New Orleans, then my applicant pool that I'm first reading are students coming from New Orleans. The second reader, after I make a decision, the second reader is doing it based on the college. So our second reading layer, every single college is assigned one of our staff members to usher in or to really fully think about that class very carefully in detail using the data. There could be a disagreement between first reader and second reader. First reader might say yes, I believe in this case, second reader might say no, you know, when I look at this, I don't agree. And that student goes into a committee review to finalize that decision. We maintain a very close eye on the profile of the admitted class, like I said, on a daily basis, and it really allows us to shape the class for each discipline appropriately. For example, it does matter, you know, I've heard it all my career for the last 20 years, improving women in STEM is critical, right? So do we see students who we think have the potential, promise and potential, we need to fully understand that student in their totality in that discipline? Yes, the answer is yes. <coughs> So this is a quote that comes out of um, the WICHE report. WICHE is the West, Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. They do all of the enrollment projections nationally for enrollment environments across the country. And in 2013, they put out the projection set that was really a concerning projection set. I'd say there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. But what I also will say is that for flagship institutions like LSU, the WICHU report and what they released in 2013 sets the context for the challenge of what we're in over the next decade or two. In their closing um, argument, they're saying for higher education that the status quo is just no longer sustainable. Especially for public institutions, we have to find ways in which we are including students and their participation by adequately measuring them on the front end, not creating arbitrary standards, and making sure that students are participating in such a high, at, at a rate in which, first of all, that they're ready, they have the promised potential to be successful on your campus, and number two, that that student can come on, participate in your campus, and graduate from your institution, right? That we just are needing to really understand the, the situation that we're in nationally and what we're heading into over the, the next two decades. So, those are the slides that I have. 
I'll take any questions that, that we um, that you might have or I can address. <laughs> Certainly invite the president also to, to be able to step up if, if there's any questions that go beyond. So my responsibility is to check the top of this. Jose, if I just add a couple of points. Um, I'd like to say we're real innovative with this. Uh, we might have been a little more innovative if we'd adopted what the faculty senate resolution did in 2006, which said to move in this direction. But we didn't have the tools or the technology or the personnel really to do it. Now that we can, we're kind of on the back end of this. Uh, there are only eight uh, flagship institutions in the country that haven't adopted this, and there's only two in, in the top 50 public universities that we know of that actually the other 48 have adopted holistic. Uh, there's one distinct difference we tell the op-eds, unlike an Ivy League that does holistic or a number of the Chapel Hills or the Virginias who have a finite set of freshmen, we have room to bring in out-of-state students to help our in-state students yeah. as well. And when we took a look at who we might have rejected or had been rejecting, we were the out-of-state about 25 to 30 percent are international students and out-of-state students that we were rejecting that would have gotten a rejection letter and then we would have said but you can still go through the appeals process it's the student from Washington State from Seattle with a, and Ken mentioned it a 4.3 grade point average who had a 32 ACT last year we would have rejected the student and said you, you can go through the appeals process and I'm sure this person was getting offers from anybody all over the country. And, and I think of our daughter who got, and the reason we rejected it is because the state of Washington's core curriculum doesn't match Louisiana's. Our daughter who got flat rejected at Clemson five years ago, Clemson's changed to holistic now, but was rejected because South Carolina's core curriculum didn't match Louisiana's. And she was asked, she said she could appeal. And I remember this conversation with her five years ago. She said, why would I appeal at Clemson when I've already been accepted at Chapel Hill, Michigan, and Wisconsin? And she just graduated from Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, when you delve into this, international students who have different standards, I, I think of Oxford, where the highest grade point average you can have at Oxford is a first. The third is the low. It's completely reversed. We have a a good 30 to 40 international students were still calling through to look at their qualifications of which we would have sent them a rejection letter that said but you can still appeal that there are those that are writing locally that think that that international student from south africa or china has also applied at a bunch of other louisiana schools that's not true i guarantee the student in seattle who's now enrolled here didn't apply to a bunch of louisiana schools that individual applied at LSU. <coughs> and without taking a closer look, all we're doing is taking a group that's on the edge and taking a closer look at who they are and what they've accomplished because we can now. We can do it and we're doing exactly what our peers are doing all over the United States. And we just didn't have the ability to do it. Now, there are those that think that we're cannibalizing students within the state from other universities. Well, so far we've seen growth in enrollments at places all over the state, even at our other LSU institutions, even at UNO, which had their first enrollment increase in eight years, as we had an 18% increase in New Orleans kids. We may actually have more students going to college in Louisiana than ever before this year, which is something people haven't read. They see it as a finite group. We see it as opportunities, providing wider opportunities to students who are bringing in talents that we would never look at, student government president. The valedictorian who had a 4-0 at her high school, had a 22 ACT, but her math score was so far. If she wanted to go to engineering, we, right. would, we couldn't have gone this route, <coughs> but she wanted to go to mass comp. Right. Because, because we took a closer look at this. That valedictorian, that valedictorian with those same scores had been in the state of Texas. She's the top of her class. She would have gotten in in the top 10% or top 7.5% to both Texas Austin and Texas A&M. ACT is a, rough, it's a top 10% rule in Texas. So we're just taking a closer look and doing what we should be doing because we now can do it. And it, it makes people nervous because we're not, we're not doing away with the ACT. 
we're not doing away with grade point averages, we just have better tools and a better way to analyze what these students have accomplished. They, they lost their home in the flood. They fought two tours of duty in Afghanistan and had a 2-9 and not a 3-0. We want to know these things about these students. And that's, that's why this class is so robust and it hasn't, we haven't declined any. And at the end of the day, we're talking really about, we took a look at about 3,000 to 25,000 students and we're talking about 400 students, of which 25% of those are those international and out-of-state students whose core curriculum didn't match Louisiana's. So, and we would have rejected them two years ago. They would have been rejected because they didn't meet the core <coughs> curriculum standards and those two figures that we placed everything on. So that's real, it's not complicated. We took that appeals process that nobody used. And we simply said, we'll do it and take a closer look at it and on the front end before you have to worry about going through an appeals process after we rejected you. And we're just doing what, what Chapel Hill does. We're just doing what Florida does, what Georgia does. Even West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee. So it's not a, it's not a, a, a number of application issue. It's just, it's just a deeper look more comprehensive look at the students who apply. Right. <coughs> so, question? <coughs> yes. Um, the quality or characteristics of these students, how do you measure those things? In such by guesswork, by reading these things, or is there any other more scientific way of evaluating them? Because you are adding GPA, SESS, and other sports. Yeah. But traditionally, again, when, when you get to, to really being able to do this the way that, that institutions do it, all those things become quantitative, right? You assign a score to every single one of those categories. Again, this year we had a smaller number of students that we did that, that we did that, that for. Really, we were looking more at overall the high school transcript. The biggest part of our evaluation this year was the deeper dive into the high school transcript. So again, looking at how many courses that they have at the highest level of their curriculum and how many of those courses did the student you know, attempt to take and what were their grades. One of the most common questions I get from families all the time is saying, well, should my student step up to an AP class and get a C or should they stay at the honors track and get an A or B? And my answer to them is, that's not the, that's not, that's not the question. I want your, your child to, to take the appropriate rigor based on their conversation in their home environment with their teachers and guidance counselors. Ideally, for competitiveness, I would want them to step up to AP, and I would want them to see, to, to, to get to that A or B level in that rigor course. So this year, it was more the deeper review of the transcript, more than anything else. What was available, what did they take, what were their scores, and how did that align with the area that they're suggesting they want to study on this campus? Um, Coefficient for all these scores. Do you generate the coefficient based on your data, or do you take the coefficient from other schools? Like how much point you give to GPA, how much point you give to SES, or how much point you give to other things? <coughs> Along with that, the reputation of the school you are recruiting from. Yes. Because the grade in all these schools are. Well, you would think, right? You would think. <coughs> but interestingly enough, when when in my previous environments, the last two flagships. Students at and Temple just released a study, this Temple University, so I, I encourage you to look at their study that they just released as well. They found that when a student, when even across their home station in Pennsylvania, when they look at their students who had a 3.7 or higher GPA, that 3.7 was their, was their kind of their limit. That's, that was what was predicting second year retention above a 2.5 or higher at Temple. Delaware, Delaware did this whole transition too. Same thing, we found the same thing when we controlled even for the high school environment, right? So when you look at, at what students were coming out of the high school experience, GPA still predicted higher than um, as they, it was interesting is now, I just got the study, the, the study from, from Delaware. They, now they're looking at their predictive uh, assessment at the front end by college. They look at it by 
SAT and GPA. In the studies nationally, SAT and GPA together have historically measured as the highest predictor of student success. What Delaware is finding is that for, they have nine colleges and only two colleges was that true. Every other college high school grade point average predicted higher than SAT and GPA for their freshman class. The two colleges that were, that, that, um, were, were high school GPA and SAT strengthened the prediction were undeclared, interestingly enough, and nursing. Engineering even had a higher prediction just using high school grade point average. So we still need to build our, our, our data, our data sets. This is the first year we're collecting all this other data that's new, right? We've never collected this data. So if you're trying to run any kind of modeling on the data sets we have right now, the only thing we have in the system are the two, the two items, GPA and SAT. So over time, as we, as we continue to unfold this, we're going to be able to really get into a much better set of predictors. And what's going to allow us to, to do also is for the retention efforts on the backside of this, to have greater and stronger assessments of who really might struggle on this campus, and can we support them, and how do we support them. But it's going to take us probably another two, two years or so to get there. But that point of scaling up interventions, our academic affairs and enrollment have taken that to heart. I did, yeah, I didn't have, I, I didn't get to it, but here it is, right? We started this year. We know we have a class that has the highest markers of eligibility, the highest markers of first gen, the highest highest markers of, of students that have, have um, from subgroups that historically have not participated at LSU. So we're not sitting still. We ran a regression model, again, same thing, using 10 years of data at LSU to say, who are the students at LSU that have historically struggled and have historically not persisted into their second year? Can we identify them? Well, we identified over 1,300 students, right? Well, 1,300 students with, with, with the top number. We've been meeting with a set of, of, of eight offices from across, across the, the community and we've broken up that, that cohort of 1,300 students into smaller cohorts of about 200. And again, instead of sitting and saying, well, let's wait until the student raises their hand and says they're struggling, we're proactively reaching out to those students and asking them to come in, sit down, and let's talk. A lot of these students, again, are low-income, first-gen students. It's not ability. What it is is a lack of information and an inability to navigate the complexities of our system. But if we can increase their engagement in key services on this campus, we have a Cadillac model of services. We have supplemental instruction, academic coaching, we have tutoring, we have things that can help students outside the classroom. But we have to get the right students in the right spaces to be served, right? And so, again, I think about Delaware. Delaware had a 93% retention rate. Not really because we recruited a better student than what we recruited this year. Well, this is what we were using. We were using science. We were meeting every single week as a community and saying, we know the thousand students that might struggle. Who's reaching out to them? Who's keeping track of where they're engaging? And are they engaging in the right things? We would meet every single week until we got to the final about two or 300 students and saying, okay, here's two or 300 students. We, they have not met with, with, with somebody on a frontline position, an interventionist success coach is what we call them there. So what do we know about them? Have they gone to a supplemental uh, instruction session? Have they gone to academic coaching? Have they gone to academic advisement? The institutions that are successful and student success are doing it this way. It's using data, being proactive, and it's about relationship with student. This is the era of relational approaches, not transactional approaches. It's not good enough to just say, I sent the email to the students to tell them. It doesn't work. A couple of questions. Apparently, uh, the uh, recruiting did a fantastic job. We have 24,000 applicants. Yes, sir. But did they have anything with <coughs> holistic uh, uh, admission? To a, to, I mean, one could argue. Because the student doesn't yes. know anything about that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. The second question I had was, you talked about the higher end uh, data, that how many students did we have that they had uh, higher ACT scores? Yes. How about the lower end? Uh, how many students we had, or what percentage had lower than the 22? Yeah, can we, you share with us, please? Yeah, we, we could. We can send that back out. The reason we focus on the high end is because that's been the question, right? The question has been that we, 
we, because of holistic review... As a professor, I'm worried about Lori. No, you know, we can absolutely share that with you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, but I don't want to speak off the cuff because I don't have it in front of me, but I'll send it up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The reason is, uh, another thing I want to add, I've been here many years that we had open admission and we had, gosh, 40, 50 percent dropouts. Yes. And then we had all the real courses. And the community, they come talk to me. Sure. Louisiana community. They're coming and telling me, you're doing the same thing again. You have a flagship. You're doing so great. Everybody wants to come to you. Let's see, you're messing it up. Yes. So apparently, and I said, why? He said, well, you're accepting these students, what the media say. Yes based on the recommendation letters, based on essays. Have you ever seen a bad recommendation letter? I said, no, i never seen one. I have. <laughs> I've, been, I've, been I've, I've, seen, I've, I've seen 20, 30,000 applications. The point I would like to make, if this thing is going to work, we have to do a better job at telling people yes. that we are not accepting students just based on recommendation letters and Essays. Yes. Because that's what is yes. really like. Yes. I mean, we are telling people. And, and thank you for that. And when we made the two, this was fantastic thing. Fantastic uh, uh, presentation. Just, this is too complex for oh, a lay sure. person in Louisiana. Yes. I'm sorry to understand. Absolutely. We're all academic. If you're going to do it in a simple, simple way, tell people how you're doing, how you're getting students that they will success. This is too complicated. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Your faculty and in the system, and so I thought this was appropriate for this audience, and hopefully it armed you with a lot of good information to be able to go out and debate with some of these myths that are floating around. I hope that you're able to take this and now be able to, to really have a conversation that's much more in depth than what you're suggesting, because we're hearing it too. Now, we're making our, our way all across the state speaking to every editorial board, being on news stations, morning shows this morning, I hate being on TV. Thank you, Ashley Arsenal. But we're doing our due diligence, talking to guidance communities. Our national conference is next week um, in Salt Lake. My entire calendar is filled with guidance counselors that I'll be meeting with every single hour during the, the time out in Salt Lake to, again, have this conversation. <clears throat> this conversation is appropriate for you, your faculty. You're right. For the public, this is too much. Right? And so we're not doing that. But you're right. I, I hope, I hope everyone's walking out of this room and saying, I have a lot more information about how this works. And it doesn't seem as flimsy as I'm reading in the newspaper. So one of those great myths is that to get away from the open enrollment of the 70s right. that most, many publics were involved with, that we adopted these practices of ACT and, and grade point average in the 80s or mid, mid to early 80s. We actually didn't mandate the ACT until 2001. So it was optional up until for two decades. So it was really the great point average that we set a standard on to get away from the open admissions. But the standardized test issue wasn't even mandated until 2001. So we're not that far. So as we learn more and have more tools, we're just, this is just a progression in understanding students now that we have more information. But the rhetoric is that we adopted the ACT and the GPA in 1984 and to get away from the open admission. We're not going back to open admission. We're just taking a closer look at these students and especially the ones who are on the edge who are bringing different qualities and attributes or if they're from out of state and all of a sudden we think the Louisiana core curriculum is somehow superior to everybody else's. Right. Which I'm not convinced it is. Right. Yes, question in the back. Um, it seems like you've been doing great work, thank you so much. And I can say, at least from the colleagues I've spoken to, you're pretty much preaching to the choir here with, uh, um, uh, with this admissions process. My question is actually slightly, uh, on a slight tangent, it has to do with international students. I noticed that there, uh, in the freshman class, there were under 1%. Yes. And I noticed that if you, even if you got up for all of LSU and grad schools were around 5% yes. international, a lot of our uh, schools we compare ourselves to are right. 10, 15, 20%. International. So I was wondering if there were, if there was going to be any efforts or push to try to further internationalize the student body. Yeah, I mean, we're having those conversations. That, you know, this year, without question, the focus was. I mean, I'll just say, I've made this transition in leadership numerous times now. This was the most anxious community I had walked into. 
from the freshman class perspective. It, it was the biggest loss of, of, we had missed our target last year by 550 students. I, I just, I had never walked into that context. And the whole, even for me, I would go home at night thinking, can we really do this? I was banking on the fact, on the idea that the brand strength of LSU and that equity truly would translate in, 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 and resonate in the marketplace in a way that it would capture the kind of, of, of freshman class and headcount that this institution needed. So our entire focus, I say that because the entire focus was really on first year domestic uh, freshmen to get that right. We are having conversations around the international footprint. We are, I'm keenly aware that this is very different than my previous institution as it relates to the reach internationally. We do have folks on campus that are doing some of that work right now with LSU Global. Um, we're having conversations more and more with those folks there. I think there's things that we can do internationally that we're not doing right now. So again, I guess one step at a time, I still feel like my head is underwater, but, um, but I think LSU has a great opportunity to do some work internationally. And, and more about, that's a great point, we're about 35% below where we used to be about 15 years ago. And we've got a lot of work to do in this area. I, it starts by taking a closer look at the 30 we would have rejected and told them to, to, to <laughs> right. go through the appeal process. Um, but we've got to become much more aggressive on the international market to get back the globalization that where we were versus where we are now. There's another question. Yes, Greg. Media thinks we're relaxing our ACT requirement. Right. You come in here, voted with an excellent and crafted presentation. The anecdotal example that you give us was somebody who had the ACT score and the GPA was thrown out for some other reason, right. and you were addressing that. It would seem to me that you want to have an anecdotal story ready to go with somebody that just missed the ACT criteria, but was admitted because they turned out to be the next cure for cancer or what have you, right. got to get that way. And then peripherally, it does, how many cases are there likely to be like that? Again, we have about 400 students in total that were um, outside of the parameters of what historically have been the Board of Regents requirement. Um, All those four had being ACT? No. Okay. And, and interestingly enough, of that, we were just looking at this number yesterday. Of the board, of the exceptions, remember, the board requires you to have a 3.0 or a 25, not a 22. LSU standards are 22 and 3.0. Board of Regents says 3.0 or 25, so that or is critical. So when you look at just who's been the exceptions, the 400, there was only 15 students that missed it because of the ACT composite. So they're eight, they're generally their, um, their GPAs were strong enough because of that OR statement not to classify them in that bucket. That's been historical at LSU, that's not new this year. So only 15 <coughs> missed it by a low ACT cutoff <coughs> at that nature. Yes, there's stories of students who are, who are the 20s. You know, I think of one student who was coming from a rural community who was, I think, a 20, at the, um, right under 21 composite. Math score was something like a 26 math, right? Um, student had a three, no, two, uh, 295 with the family? 295. So right on the cusp. I mean, again, these are the students that, that the president was just kind of saying. is like, these, no one is, is unconscionable for any admission office, and certainly under my leadership, to assess a student who has a 2.0 and a 15, 16, 17 ACT and say, we're okay with admitting that student. It's just not gonna happen. Our responsibility as an admission office is to make sure that the assessment is strong enough where you fully believe that the student is ready to engage, prepared to engage in your environment based on what you understand and will be likely successful. If you don't believe that, you should not be admitting that student. And again, we're doing it by using the totality of the application. So even with students who, as an example, had the 2.0, right, the math subscore is stronger in that case. The students' science interests aligned with that. Their core, their core uh, classes in science were stronger than anything else. Um, we felt had some of the non-cognitive variables that we looked at. We felt the student probably could do it here. That's 295 students, yes. Thank you.
Any last questions? From there. Yes. Yes, I am. Um, would you be willing to share with your PowerPoint? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Do you have uh, more? Do you have more of a simplified one than that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll work on that. Well, I'm just asking because people have suggested that would be good for the public. For talking about yeah. yeah, we'll do that. Joan, yeah, we'll get a great. question in the back first. Yes, sir. What is your retention monitoring plan for the students that are on the cusp? Um, will there be an annual report provided that outlines the the you know the retention rate for students who uh, were selected qualitatively as opposed to or I guess quantitatively based on your regression analysis and based on non-cognitive factors as well that that will come out every year so that the the results can be monitored because it's not just coming in. It's what's going to be the graduation rate four years from now, or what's going to be the four-year graduation rate versus the five-year graduation rate versus the six-year graduation rate. Uh, do, you, do you have a, a plan for monitoring this setup at this time? Yeah, not necessarily by those cutoffs, right? Because the reality is we're looking at the totality of the class, and we're, we've been working with IR on saying this is how we want to look at retention comprehensively. What's interesting about the 1,300 students that came up on the regression model, some of those students, the folks who are working with them are saying, why is this student identified as likely to drop out? The student has a 30 ACT and is coming, again, here was a big part of our discussion in those committee meetings. You would think, now, in fact, I won't single out the school, but there's a local high school that everyone would perceive, if I said the name, everyone in this room would say, yeah, that's Students from there are great students. They're not going to struggle here. This student had an ACT 30, came from a high school like that, with that kind of reputation. Had a 3-1 GPA. The model identified that student as at risk. Hard to really fool. I mean, it's a multivariate analysis, right? So there's other things that the model picked up through the factor analysis that said these markers that this student has match up with, with this case, and this student is likely to, to, to struggle here at LSU, likely not to return for their second year. So I, I kind of want to get, I don't want to get into this, this idea of here are students that are going to be successful, here are students that we're comprehensively reviewing and, are, are, and really are not going to be successful here, and we should monitor these students differently. We've got to look at the whole class, otherwise we're going to be missing students and not understanding, not fully learning from what we're doing in, in the full scope of, of the work that we're doing over the time here. We're going to put out pretty robust reports yearly on what's happening with the success metrics of this class. For me, again, and I said this to a newspaper the other day, this is not, to me, this isn't a grand experiment. This is the way admissions has worked nationally and for every institution I've been a part of. I am highly confident that the students are not only going to match the success metrics of the previous years, but going to exceed those metrics. Because we're doing more in a student success area. These students are going to exceed metrics of the previous cycles. So in the past, uh, this is something that everybody should know, we had about a little more than 190, 200, about half of these, these reviewed exceptions of what the 400 that we have. The graduation rate of those exceptions in the past is about 49%. Our average is 68, 69%. But our exception, 49%, places us as the second best, leaving us out, the second best university in the, in the state. There's only one university with a higher than 49% overall graduation rate, and it's Louisiana Tech with 54 so the exceptions that we made in the past, which also include a lot of those core curriculum kids that we may have gone dug deep and they may have, they may have filed an appeal, but it's still better than everybody else's graduation rate in the entire state except one university. So that's important to know that these students in the past aren't graduating in 15, 20%, 25%. We're still graduating, national average is 54%. So these exceptions are almost near the national average in their graduation rate of the ones we took in the past. Yes, and, and what's interesting about that study is the students that were in that exception bucket, their, their success metrics mirrored the bottom quarter of the, the students that were not exceptions. To tell you how arbitrary that line is, their success metrics were no different than kids who were not labeled exceptions, but were in the bottom quality metrics of the incoming class that were 
would have then said, oh, those are regularly admitted students. The metrics look virtually the same. It's just a, an arbitrary kind of line that we've drawn to say, this is where we're cutting it off. Joan, quick. Are we using these same metrics as far as giving out scholarships to the <coughs> Yeah, so this year the metrics are the same. We've expanded the, the, the amount of, of scholarship available to distribute this year. Again, what we did there was use science, econometric modeling, to determine what, um, what really it would take to produce a student's likelihood to enroll at LSU. And what we found through that analysis um, last year was that our out-of-state students, we were woefully being just completely off in terms of what we were affording or offering students from out of state in terms of awards. So the metrics stayed the same though. We, we, we kept ACT, GPA as the, the key metrics that drive scholarshiping, um, but we just made sure that we were market appropriate with the scholarship offers. All right, thank you very much, Jose. We really appreciate you. Our next speaker is Julia Fair. Uh, she's the Senior Director of Annual Giving. Some of us had questions about crowdfunding and how the foundation was actually approaching that uh, last year, and they kind of got their program organized. So she's going to talk to us. I'm going to let her and Jose switch. While they do that, I'm going to remind you that that is training and seminars <laughs> that are on the list that some of you still have in front of you are there for a reason. We want to build LSU to be the best place it can be for whoever is here. We know that from the data, some of our first generation faculty who didn't come from advantages of having faculty mentors are at risk for not succeeding as faculty. We want to help them wherever possible. We know that some faculty that achieve the associate rank then all of a sudden struggle, maybe not even due to their own fault because department heads change, priorities in the department change. We want to help those individuals to be successful because we're looking to make LSU be the place that everybody, whether it's faculty, staff, or student, wants to come and be a part of. And so that's not, not to borrow a bad phrase, but we're trying to look at a holistic approach to how do we make LSU a much better place for all of us. And so in that regard, then... Um, you may have, have to have some come up and help us, but... Uh, <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am excited to tell you about uh, what we named Launch LSU. It is our crowdfunding platform. Um, it is the first LSU-hosted crowdfunding platform. It is managed by the LSU Foundation as the 501c3 that can handle philanthropic uh, gifts for LSU. It is for our students, our faculty, and our staff to engage in crowdfunding initiatives. Um, I'm happy to say that we've actually hosted eight campus campaigns so far. Um, we just, hopefully y'all saw it, uh, last week and the week before, the band celebrated their 125th anniversary and we raised, I think, a little over 22,000 in a week um, to support the band development fund. We've also had programs like the Good Samaritan Fund at the School of Vet Med. 
We've also had programs at Ag, um, Stripes, We've had a couple of different. The goals, of course, are in any type of crowdfunding um, platform. It is to engage and educate students about philanthropy, um, giving them the tools to help fund their own projects. Um, it's to empower the passionate students, um, faculty and staff, to fundraise. We're not here to tell you which projects might resonate um, or not. You know, you are experts in your field and you know your community and what people might be interested in funding. We're here to provide the platform for you to do that. And then to connect the global tiger community to campus projects. So whether they be a, a tiger, like an alum or not, they just believe in what LSU is doing, what our great faculty are researching, what our students are engaged in. Um, it is to bring people from across the world and bring them into LSU's family. Why it matters. Um, it showcases the projects, the passion, the ideas that we create here on this campus. Fosters innovation and philanthropy. Um, hopefully it offers you guys additional resources. Um, I know that a lot of times, you know, your deans and your department chairs, they have their philanthropic priorities, but you might have projects that could benefit from, or students primarily is where we're getting it from, but $500 just to get them over that hurdle, right? Well, you can't really use your resources, so let them use their community, whether it be their mom, their dad, their aunt, or it be um, sorority sisters that have moved on, they have communities that they can tap into to fund their projects. And we hope that it gives them real world experience, right? I mean, this is not just a, I'm gonna throw it up there and see who comments. Um, there is a project plan, there is a marketing plan, there is strategy behind it, there is writing, um, there is uh, imagery. So we actually ask them, um, we haven't required it yet, but we're, we're telling them to tap into creating videos, um, writing creatively about what their project is gonna do. And then also, so not only learning about how to go out there and get the funding, but then how do you say thank you? And how do you continue to engage those people who raised their hand and said, that project interests me. Okay, well what's the next project that I could do that that same community might be interested in and might give me even more money when I can show them the results of that first project. So how it works. Um, we have project leaders that tell the world about their projects, right? Um, you have team members, though, that you have picked that help you get that word out. Um, we hope that by building a, a team of people that you will tap into more resources. But somebody, of course, has to be the leader and then you need others to build out your community. Um, Tigers Who Care can contribute directly through the platform. So the platform actually does everything. You can it, it host your content, so it'll host your videos, your um, pictures, your copy, um, but you can send it out through Twitter, Facebook, email. Um, it can house your contacts or you can embed a link into other forms. So it really, it's a robust uh, platform that we've invested in. Um, and then you can thank. We, you know, I hope that you guys get thanked for those who give here. Stewardship is a huge piece, showing the impact, showing like that the, the funds went to good use is really important. So this platform allows you to do that. So how do you start a project? So student organizations, they have to have their advisor. Um, we require that they put in their advisor's name and then we have a very good relationship um, on campus and we call and talk to their advisors to make sure that it is on the up and up and everybody is you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, for faculty, we ask that for research related projects that you comply with LSU's research crowdfunding procedures which are posted on the web. Um, you have to have a foundation account. So whether that be that um, you might have a department chair that will let you uh, use their foundation account. 
um, but you have to have a foundation account that is tied to your state account so that we can push the funds from the foundation into your state account. Um, and the projects, we ask that they have three team members. It's to share the load, it's also to build out the contacts. Um, you'll visit launch.lsu.edu, hit start a project, and we have robust FAQs, toolkits, we have sample emails, sample calendars, sample um, posts. This is good for Facebook, this is good for Twitter, this, we have samples all over the place and we keep adding more and more. Um, and then I have, who is not here today, um, but I have an incredible young woman that works for me that is in charge of our um, online engagement. And she's a great resource and really enjoys working with all of our partners. And so you just go to launch.lsu.edu. And I actually left um, some cards in the back with the web address and kind of how to get started and with Angelica's contact information. So always feel free to reach out to us. Does anybody have any questions? Who asked a question? Yes, Joe. So um, this kind of way of raising funds are the faculty, staff, and students limited as to who they're allowed to contact to no. try and get funding? Because not you know, usually us. there's this big donor list they're not supposed to contact. Yeah. <laughs> so the way that crowdfunding works is it's much more of a um, organic interaction. If you have that person's um, email address and your personal contacts, they clearly are a personal friend or a colleague of yours, and we do not feel like we would step into that. You are using your contacts, um, your people who have liked your Facebook page. You're pushing it out to them. You're pushing it out to people who follow you or follow your work. Um, you are building those contact lists, not us. Um, and so we really encourage you, again, we're not here to say which project might resonate. Um, like I don't understand, I'm a mass comm grad. The sciences are not my strong suit. Ornithology, whoa, okay, that's really interesting. I don't think I'd ever fund anything there, but who am I to say that that, and they actually, I mean, I've seen their fundraising campaign. They do a fantastic job. Um, they bring in a lot of money every year, but I'm not here to say which project will or will not work. We do, though, when we're working with you, make sure that you have, we'll ask questions like, how many followers do you have on Facebook? Do you only have 30 or do you have like the band? They have 30,000 people that follow the band. And so we want you to be successful. Um, and so we will work with you to make sure that where, whatever um, feed you are using, that you have enough contacts and enough community that you can be successful. We also work with you on your goals and appropriate goals. Um, our projects range anywhere from $500 for um, it was for an ag center, uh, ice cream for new students, all the way to the 22,000 at, um, at, for the band. Most crowdfunding projects do not go over 25,000 um, because you're really tapping into um, your community that's going to give you anywhere from like $10 to $1,000. Yes? Uh, can we still use Kickstarter and other we are not here to tell you yes or no on that. I am here to implore, though, that you use our resources. Um, and I say that because then we can help you build that stewardship of those folks, and we can help you build that population. We can also give them a tax receipt. We can steward them for your project. If you ever came to us or your department chair and said, I would like to see who gave to my group. I have another thing coming up. That is something that we can work with you on building out. When you go through Kickstarter, Kickstarter sends you the check, not the individual, and so you can't build your community. That, that's probably the key is the support before and after. Right, right. That the foundation can provide. <coughs> Any other questions for Julie? All right, well, thank you all so much for having me, well, and I look forward to hearing from you all from your colleagues, from your students. Yes. Our next speaker can come on up his own. Uh,
Jane from ITS. Oh, somebody you're going to go next? I can, or he's away. No. You can let's, go. let's go with some. Let's, let's go with some. Um, over the summer, actually it started late last spring, then, uh, hopefully it wasn't any of you, but it was discovered that some of our, the clickers that were being used in some classes were vulnerable, and all of a sudden, a couple of instructors found out, well, wait, my class is almost empty, but almost every student is participating with the clickers. And so, someone is here to tell us a little bit more about clicker management, some of the vulnerabilities, and some of the best practices, and then at the same time, then there's also been questions about, wait, why a single password when I've been having multiples and those type things? So, all right, so this guy's here, and he's going to tell us about all those things. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Uh, as Dr. McMillan said, my name is Sumit Chan. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for A&M. Uh, we had met over the summer, so I'm going to cover both topics. Um, so from a clicker perspective, what's based on our research and based on uh, Faculty Technology Center's input, we found out people are using both, uh, actually in three different ways. A mobile application, uh, using uh, clickers based on an uh, actual app on iOS or Android device uh, or Windows. Uh, physical clickers, but that's limited to a classroom itself. And then web-based, uh, where it's facing web-based polling. So, as has already been mentioned, there have been some concerns around academic dishonesty because of the way these applications actually function. Uh, there are various providers of these clickers, but from all the providers that we had interaction with, there's limited protection that exists today on their platforms on preventing who gets access to what or how they interact uh, with, the, uh, with the questions that are being asked or the poll that's being conducted. So, um, and with each of the vendors, there are different information they collect. Some people will collect IP address from which where you are coming, uh, your network location. Uh, some won't even collect that piece. So it becomes very difficult to uh, figure out a way to say, okay, yeah, you were physically here, uh, whereas in some cases you may not be able to do so. <coughs> so. From a university perspective, there's only a single solution that is supported through Faculty Technology Center, which is Turning Point. Uh, but we did find out that uh, there are multiple uh, solutions that are currently uh, utilized by faculty members. So one of the challenges that we had is when talking to these vendors is identifying, well, what do you have on your roadmap? Do you see academic dishonesty as, a, as an issue and how do you prevent, how do you plan on fixing that? Some of them are working on doing geolocation. So what that means is it's going to be capturing, if you're using a mobile device, it's going to be capturing your uh, longitude and latitude of your GPS and then providing the faculty member with a map that this is the location that student came from. Okay? That's one of the options that they're working on. But that changes completely differently if they're not using their mobile data. If they're using a wireless network, it's based on IP address. So it changes drastically how you would track that. So even the vendors are struggling with that piece or how to provide genuinely that this person actually came from this location. Some of the suggestions or recommendations on how uh, this can be managed is, is one of few things. If the product that you are using in your classrooms, if it's not a physical clicker, if it's you know mobile application based clicker that you're using, if that vendor provides you with the IP address, if they collect the IP address from where the person came from, you can have it as part of your syllabus that only those students that utilize LSU Wireless will get a grade, right? So we can provide you, we can tell you, hey, here's the wireless IP addresses for LSU. So they would have to be on campus. Now it could be they're not in your class, right? They, they can be in, sitting in the union or sitting in their dorm, but at least they're on campus and they're not sitting in their home, <laughs> right? So that's one uh, solution. The other is, um, it's more on the process side of things. 
uh, where you are look, collecting different data sets and doing correlation, right? So how many people are were actually in class? Does it match up with what data set you have being provided through the vendor? So it just depends. We are working with Turning Point to identify what additional options they're going to have. That is one of the, that is the officially supported solution uh, that that we have our hands on, and we work closely with them. And we're going to be working with them to see what their roadmap is for the next year or two to see how we incorporate or how we feed information back to them on what they need to be focusing on. That's all I had on the clicker. So are there any so, questions? Yeah. On this? Anybody have any questions on that? Yes. So it's me. Okay. Um, one of my department in College Bag, School of Renewable Natural Resources, I brought this up with Ken. Um, we have a, a large genetic class that is taught by one of our professors, 190 students typically in the fall, about 125 in the spring. It's uh, 1001. Um, it's typically clicker based, historically it has been. The problem came in whenever 97 kids in that class were on a group meet and were passing out the passcode whenever it was announced in class on the screen for the clicker related activity. It then immediately broadcast out to all 97. They logged in with the, it was the phones. It's not web based, it's phones. It's, it's, it's phones. Right. I mean, you know, they immediately logged in with their web based equipment and did the quiz. The, the faculty member, who will remain nameless for um, now, uh, then had several students, graduate students, come and sit in the class and count the number of students and count the number of clicker multiple times. You guys may have read about it in the paper. If you haven't, you probably will this week. Um, you're sitting here telling me that the solution is that well, you can tell us if we're on campus or we need to go back to paper. That is not an IT solution for this issue. Should we abandon Turning Point and stop using clickers in our large classes? So there are two things. One is the capability of the solutions that are out there. If the solution doesn't, Turning Point or other solutions for clickers that are out there, if they do not collect relevant information, there is no way for us to detect anything if the product itself doesn't provide the information. So you can get an IP address. A, I believe Turning Point, and there's one more vendor, I'll have to go back and check my notes, they do collect IP address that you're coming from when you connect. Do your Wi-Fi routers have IP addresses in the large classrooms? Yes. Everybody gets an individual IP address. So. Any student that comes from 167.96 starting IP address is on LSU wireless. Okay, so we could, could we ping them beforehand? Or so can, you know, whenever, whenever the students are sitting in a room like this, so if I were to log on you know, or do whatever here, you're going to know it was me, right? I will know it's you. So yes. is the question just getting that data into turning point? Or no, into the output so turning, file? Or so, the, you will get an IP address that's 167.96 and we would know, we have a way of knowing uh, through different logging mechanisms that who is assigned that particular IP address. But that is not necessarily true because somebody standing outside may also be connected. They will get a different IP address. Mm -hmm. So there are different data points that come into picture. Trying to figure out how to correlate that, we'll have to look at that specific piece as whether that data can actually be correlated. Because from a student perspective, I can still be on campus. I, I can still be on campus and still have an IP address. There is no way for me to know that they were sitting in the class. That that's what I was trying to get at. Okay, so you can't tap it down to the to the actual physical address. Right. The doing. actual physical location is something that we cannot narrow it down to. We can narrow it down to okay whether you're on campus or not, whether you're part for a wireless network. But none of the technologies can do that. So, so that's a vulnerability that our intelligent students figured out <laughs> and have utilized. I think there is a technology that can do that. Uh, you know when we uh, access the uh, electronic uh, gate, we scan our LSU ID, right? To open places where my students are. So if we can get capability like this, 
we, we say everybody getting into the classroom, they scan their ID first. Mm -hmm. So like this, I have a list, and immediately the software can compare the student using Clicker with this. And if their name is not there, they should be really... Um, yeah, their, their methods outside, yeah, their methods outside, outside of Clicker that can be some, some policies to be applied with that. Because if you catch a few students who are doing this, they will be a good example to the rest to stop doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And there are, like I said, there, there are other technologies outside of clickers. What I was trying to present is what is capable with clickers today as they exist. There are a multitude of other ways of identifying who's actually present and not. Student government has purchased, I guess you call them scanners, for the IDs for different events. Right. Academic Affairs is working with student government to see whether there can be checkouts so that in a class you could do that. But that's still in the works. Yes, so. and, and that's on, and that's you know is the same kind of scanners that um, Tiger Card Office has, or there are athletic events that scans whether to see whether you're faculty, staff, or student. So it'll be that kind of thing, but. The correlation with the clickers may not be there. Yes. I have a question. And I may be wrong about this because my experience with transit points didn't work, but I thought with turning point you could prevent it from displaying, say, a question and just the responses at the end. So unless your students are sharing the questions through the group, they're, they're sharing the password and the answer. Oh, and the answer. Yeah, they, the, the routine was. Someone who will remain nameless will be sitting in class and the day's passcode will be put up on the screen. Mm -hmm. AA1234. And immediately that would come I in mean, immediately. You know, they timed it. You know, 30 seconds later it's out on the group meet. As soon as the quiz was put up, it's C. It's C. It goes out on the group meet six or eight times. So unless depending on, I don't disagree with you, but we're not gonna we're not going to scan 190 IDs before a quiz. And we're surely not going to pass around a scanner for you to swipe right. It's not logistics, uh, logistically feasible in our big classes. So, th th and this is a problem for us because this, this went on for nine or 10 weeks before it got caught. And we had almost 90 students that lost, you know, a third of their grade for the semester, or half of the quiz grade information for the semester. And academic affairs had to do something like 130 interviews. It was insane. So the larger question becomes is should these be in the classroom at all if there's no way to restrict use of them to ensure academic honesty as opposed to a piece of paper with a signature and an 8-9 number on it? So from a mobile application perspective and a clicker perspective, both I believe Turning Point came out, Turning Point came out with a new clicker. So they have two clickers. One is basically you connect to a laptop and then you physically have to be in a geographical region, more likely just a class, to be able to utilize that clicker and it's just ABC, right? But they also, we were also informed that there is a requirement where people need to, not, it's not multiple choice only, there are, you know, text-based answers and things. So Turning Point actually has a new clicker that comes with a text pad as well. And that too, it's not web-based, it's not a mobile application, it's a physical, you have to be in a near vicinity in the classroom to be able to utilize either of those clickers. So there is that piece as well. Now if you want to go down on the path of mobile technologies, there are limitations there simply because of what those applications are and they are new on the market. I'm just carrying the flag, man, I jump on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Any other last questions? Now we're going to switch to the password. Yep. Okay. Uh, so, uh, on this specific one, what's actually happening? We are talking about uh, making changes to uh, credentials and the way people authenticate to our environment. Right? A credential is a combination of a username and password that we use uh, to access a system such as your laptops or applications. Uh, such as MyLSU, uh, Workday, the library resources, or network, such as Edgero. Today, each one of us, if you have a MyLSU ID, the, the, the not Tiger Card ID, the you, your username, you today see two of them. 
Okay, one is the username and password you use to log into my LSU, and one that you use to log into your email. Right? On the back end for us, there are three IDs. Okay, that we are managing. And this becomes a very complicated system to manage when we are now in today's day and age when we are propagating out to the cloud. So we have Workday, we are talking about a student information system. We have library resources that are third party. Moodle is another system. Right now we are managing close to about 100 or so applications, 60 of them through single sign-on, uh, which is one way of doing authentication and then another set that's based on our legacy applications. So on the back end, it becomes very, very complex to manage both the username and the password. And one thing you would have noticed since, well, uh, about the last four or five years, you have never had to change your LSU mail password unless my team suspended your account because it got compromised some way or some shape or form, right? Your LSU mail password has never changed from the day it was established and you first changed your password. But your my LSU password has to be changed either every 90 days or 180 days, depending on how long your password is. So that's what we are talking about. So this is what it actually looks like. You have one set of credentials that you use to log into my LSU, Edge Your Own, VPN, computer logon, uh, applications such as Workday, and then you have one set that is completely separate. And what we are moving towards is bringing it all together and merging it to just one account for you as a user, we are still managing three accounts on the back end. Okay? The main reason for doing these things <coughs> is to move to a modern age. You would have heard uh, multiple times by now when Tom talks about you know, modernization, the student information system. Legacy mainframe that we have is where our identity and access management actually sits today. Right? We have to move off of that into a modern age and support new applications and new platforms. But to be able to manage your identity and say, okay, this is who you are, we cannot manage three accounts and three different set of passwords, right? For you, going forward, you will still see one, but we still have to manage three in the background, but that moving, you, moving users to one set of credentials helps us consolidate things on the back end as well over time when we move to a new eye. There are also dependencies on mainframe because mainframe goes away. We have to reduce our complexity and we have to make sure that any and all systems and applications we implement, you guys only see one interface, right? Uh, today, uh, when you log into LSU email, you would have seen the LSU email login page looks a little bit different when you go through the web browser, right? But my LSU login page looks completely different. And if you have certain other applications that do their own authentication, where you may still put your MyLSU username and your password, that login screen looks completely different. This complexity is one of those complexities that we are trying to mitigate where the login screen for anything and everything becomes one, right? There are other things that we're gonna bring up. Um, this was a pain for us when we moved to Workday. Everybody could go in and change their payroll selection and the bank they want to deposit stuff on. But come December 2016, we went back to the paper. And there was a reason for that. Because accounts were compromised and payroll fraud occurred, not from our side, but paychecks went where they shouldn't have gone, right? So we went back to paper. And the main reason for that is because we didn't have enhanced security in place. So with this transition, we are talking about enhancing security by bringing multi-factor authentication for certain things, not for everything. So if you want to go and change your payroll, guess what? You will have to provide either a six-digit code or you will have an app on your mobile device or you can get a phone call on your desk phone or an email on an you know, a six-digit code on an alternate email. There are multiple ways of bringing multi-factor authentication into place. So we're going to be bringing that along next year talking about conditional access. So if you are a professor that's teaching a course on campus, you're logged into a system, but at the same time your account is also trying to log in from China or from Russia, we can stop that by bringing this change into play. Today we cannot, right? 
Talking about secure messaging, you want to share confidential data with somebody else? There are very limited options available to you today. And email, as a standard, is not a secure way of sharing confidential information. But by implementing secure messaging, you will be able to send encrypted messages to anybody. Okay? That should be actually should be something that should come online uh, early spring. The last two, which is advanced threat protection and URL management, that's thing that I personally want to implement because I have a very, very small team and we deal with phishing messages on a daily basis and it is becoming a painful experience to shut down each and every mobile uh, URL that we get that's related to phishing. Okay? Right now we have about 7,000 URLs that we have blocked in the last year alone. Okay? But by implementing those two technologies, which is advanced threat protection and URL management, what we can do is whether you receive your email at your at lsu.edu mailbox or you, students that forward their email to their Gmail, regardless of wherever you are in the world, by click of that configuration and by <coughs> managing URLs that way, regardless of wherever you are, whatever device you're using, whether you're on campus or not, we can prevent you from going to the phishing page. Okay. It also allows us to stop uh, malicious attachments. Um, I don't know how many people receive invoices on a daily basis, but we receive invoices on a daily basis, but only half of them are actually true invoices. The other are malware. Right. So those things help us bring, uh, bring protection to our email environment. Okay, so dates of rollout. We are the guinea pigs for anything that new happens. So ITS has already gone through this uh, this transition of merging all the accounts and making sure everything is working and the new services that are gonna come with it. Um, let me see. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but for all the other departments, we're gonna start doing migration starting October 10th, and it's gonna end November 28th. <coughs> Our goal is that by early November is when all the departments have been migrated, but early November is when we're gonna target students, because that's about 60,000 to 70,000 some accounts that we have to sync. But by early November, all the departments would have moved uh, into, uh, into the new way of doing things. So what's the impact? Well, when your department rolls through this and your accounts get synced, for your email services, anything related to Office 365, which is email, office, uh, Skype for business, or OneDrive, you will have to re-authenticate, but this time you're gonna be using your my LSU password to log in, rather than your LSU mail password, okay? Part of this all rollout is also introduction of two new services. One is Box. Box is a collaborative service. It's a file storage where you can collaborate both with internal users as well as external users. Box is being rolled out to all faculty, staff, and student employees. So we have been working with uh, each department IT contact and walking them through how to set up Box, what the folder structure is gonna look like, and then you will be able to store, actually it's unlimited storage for individual users, right? It's unlimited storage, but the maximum file size for a single file is five GB. So if you have files smaller than five gigs, you can store as many files as you want, right? Uh, part of this also is going to be, we, we are going to be sharing out what the best practices are, what things to do and not do. And with Box, there's only, uh, there's one caveat of what you cannot store in Box, okay? Uh, social security numbers, credit cards, and health related data. Anything that can be classified as HIPAA data, those are three things you cannot store in Box. Student data, um, you want to store your research, uh, papers or anything like that, go ahead and store. You're working on a book and you want to collaborate with another professor at another university, Box is a perfect example for us. Okay? The other piece, the other new service is Microsoft Teams. Um, so Microsoft Teams is a platform, um, let me ask this, how many of you know what Slack is? Microsoft Teams is uh, Slack, 
basically. It is persistent chat, so you can continually chat with whoever is part of your team and it's stored there uh, forever. You can also have a team-based OneDrive, so all your team documents can be stored there, and you also get a team-based email. So what this allows you to do is you can have internal collaboration. Now, Teams is only for internal users, okay? This is for faculty, staff, and students. So one of the things that can be done here, and one of the use cases that we have discussed in different forums, is if you have a class, you have LMS, which is Moodle, and you can do chats and discussions in that, but this is another avenue for you to have an open interaction with your class uh, if you want to. So you can have all students within a class, within a particular section as part of a team, okay? So that's what's gonna be happening, and this is just a general reminder uh, to be, you know, be mindful of the passwords that you utilize. Uh, one of the things that was, uh, from our perspective, was a pain point of the segregation. There was a maximum password limit that uh, was there with LSU mail accounts. Your password could only be 10 to 16 characters, uh, but with this sync, that 16 character limit goes away. So you can have passwords longer than 16 characters. I don't know how many people have passwords longer than 16 characters, but I do. Uh, right? My the password that I've been dying to use since I came here, but I haven't been able to simply because of these limitations, is about 50 characters long. Uh, it's just a long phrase. Um, but we also want uh, you to make sure that you set your password reset questions. Okay? How many of you know what password reset questions you have as of today? Okay. Please go into my LSU, search for password reset questions. If you don't know your answers, make sure you set them because those things are gonna become critical as we go through this process because we are gonna eventually get to a point where you will be responsible for resetting your own passwords if you forgot it because we're gonna do text-based, call-based, you have, it's a self-service thing, right? So make sure you set your PRQs uh, and, and uh, remember those. We are forcing you to answer your PRQs, your password reset questions, every time you're gonna reset your password, right? So that's kind of a practice for everybody. Um, we are working with departmental IT contacts. We, are, uh, we, have, uh, we have done uh, presentations to Staff Senate. Uh, Associates and Assistant Deans was this morning. Um, we also made presentations to Business Managers Meeting. Uh, and we have had actually multiple meeting with uh, uh, the IT contacts for departments to make sure that they understand because they are the ones that are going to be managing what that folder structure looks like. Uh, we are going to have um, Grok articles that's going to describe the three services, Box, Teams, and OneDrive, what, what are the different features, and depending on your use case, it will help you decide what you, wanna, what you should be using. Um, and then Service Desk is there to answer any questions uh, you guys have when we get to that rollout stage. Any quick questions? Yeah, yes. yes, sir. <coughs> in the classroom, when you can log on a computer, then yes, you have to log on to Moodle again. Why there's a two step process? Um, because of this reason, right? So we don't have seamless sign on in place. So when you log into computer today, there is no direct link because computer login is through Active Directory. Uh, and I'm going to go into a little bit of technical stuff. It's Active Directory, but your Moodle authentication is through a different mechanism. So after this one would be just one log? No. We still have to go through multiple steps to bring all these different technologies that we have and consolidate into a seamless experience. So when you log into a computer, with your multi-factor authentication, if that's enabled, then you have access to any and all applications that depend on that authentication. Even though, like I said, we are managing different accounts, even though you only see one account, and one password on the back end, we are syncing everything up, so but it becomes difficult for applications to transition from one username and password or one authentication source to the next. So our eventual goal is that, that when you log into the system with your MyLS username and password, you have access to anything and everything that you're gonna have. But uh, a prime example of this kind of experience is, 
if you log into a computer today with your username and password, your mileage username and password, when you will open Outlook, after this is done, you don't have to enter your password. Your Outlook will pick up the username and password that you have logged in with, your mileage username and password that you have logged in with, and sync automatically. Not Moodle yet. Yes, ma'am. In the back. Um, okay, so lucky me, my password was up for expiring yesterday. So mm -hmm. I had to go ahead and change my password. Mm -hmm. And I did this in my office, and I did it on the desktop that I have in my office, and, and that worked. And it said something like, don't try to use it, the new password for 30 minutes, and it might take two hours, you know, which it always says, but it's never taken two hours. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this time it sort of did. <laughs> so. The first thing that happened was um, I could not, I didn't have any internet on my laptop. When I went in to get that, there was no internet at all. And um, I tried everything I knew to try and get no internet. Um, so I had to go to class or to a meeting or something. So I went to do that and I came back and my phone said, you need to authenticate and roam. Correct. My laptop still not there. And I ended up taking my laptop over to my IT person. And it still took her about 20 minutes okay. to get it to. And this was part of what I missed. You have to forget that you will, you know, on the network, on the thing. Or the okay. Thing. okay. And then I had to reboot my laptop and still wait about, you know, 10 minutes or so before it finally came in. And, said, and asked for your password. And asked for the password for, for Edumon. Okay. So I'm not too sure what's going on with that, but it, uh, but just to let you know, and this is nothing new for me, even on my old laptop, this is a new laptop too, by the way, but my old laptop, I would have to let it sit and run in my office for a couple of hours before I could change the login when I was at home. And, still, you know, and this is Edgeroom? Um, uh, specifically to Edgeroom or? Well, it would be Edgeroom on campus. Okay. But, you know, not, but I, would, I mean, I couldn't get it to, to, I mean, I'd have to have it on campus and running before it would pick up the, the new ID. Okay. It wouldn't do it from my, my home. Right. Um, so, two things. On the Edgeroom front, I'll have to go back and find out specifically. But on the account side, the reason why we say 30 minutes to two hours is because that password has to go to multiple locations, multiple yeah. directories, and we have to get confirmation back that that change has occurred in that system before that password can be utilized. So that's why we say 30 minutes to two hours, because depending on what's happening with Microsoft uh, that day or what's happening with one of our other systems on mainframe, that communication can take a good bit of time. Okay, so speaking of Microsoft, mm -hmm. this is driving me crazy, but when I am in my email, uh, and, I, and it always happens when I'm trying to send an email, I'll open it up, I'll hit send, and it'll say, oh, session has expired, sorry, we're logging you off, you have to log back in, and by the way, it's a good idea to close your browser. So then when I come back into it, this is just with my mail, it'll, Microsoft will come up and say, we need your Microsoft password. And then it'll say, you know, like, I can set it up so it'll, won't ask me every time. It'll, but it, I mean, it brings it up, but it won't ask for the password every time. Okay. It'll have it filled in if I do that. What's up with that? <laughs> Man, you're asking questions that I haven't, I haven't been asked before. Uh, so let me do this. I will, I will, I will take your information and. I actually want to either myself or somebody from our email team will contact you and we want to see what this looks like because usually when these kind of issues come up, it's everybody faces it, right? So it, it could be multiple variables, but we want to see and actually walk through what that actually looks like so that we can identify what the root cause is. Okay. In the background. Yeah. I was, uh, you made a comment about the Microsoft Teams. I thought you said it was only internal. I actually use Microsoft Teams quite a lot with the Act Center, and I have it set up because I work with people around the country, and it does. It actually works with those external partners. We can communicate, we can change, um, edit files together. I think it's just the administrative part that it doesn't allow. So let me ask you this question. The other entities that you collaborate with, yeah. are they higher education? Um, they're government agencies, stakeholders, um, 
like county parish agencies, um, other universities, federal So facilities. what we have found that it does not work if between higher educations and higher educations. Okay. It's because of Microsoft, the way Microsoft has done their education licensing for Microsoft, it doesn't work necessarily if both entities are on, in Microsoft world. So the other educations, if you're collaborating, they may not be in Microsoft, so that's why they can work. Because we have tried setting up teams to be in Accenture and LSU, and it doesn't work. So, um, and this is an open question with Microsoft for us. It may be down the path that it may be coming. Yeah. And I really like it a lot. It's great. The only thing I don't like about it is the chat. So I'm just curious, is Box going to be similar to Teams? Because having that chat... Box doesn't offer chat functionality where you can chat one-on-one. -on -one. However, if I share a document with you, on that document, there is a chat feature where you can, as you're working on the document, collaborating, you can do chat messaging there for that <coughs> particular document. But there is no chat feature on one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, but it's similar. Yeah. It's it's similar. Yeah, you can and and the way we have we are deploying Box uh, is going to be where uh, it's linked with Microsoft. So you log in with your Microsoft credentials. So when it opens up and it's you want to open a Microsoft Word document, it's opening it in Word online. Okay, so you can collaborate with anybody around the country that has Microsoft accounts. As long as they have a Microsoft, actually they don't even have they don't actually need a Microsoft account either. Um, to access Box, they just need a personal Box account. But if they already have a Box account with the email address that you're going to be collaborating with, then they would have access. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much so much. We appreciate that. Our last speaker today is uh, Summer, Director of LSU Women's Center. And while she's coming up, uh, my visit with uh, CTO Ballinger yesterday they're transitioning the help desk into a full service desk. So some of the problems that Judith has, has had, and they say, well, we can't help you. No, that won't happen in the future as they make that transition. So. Director of the Women's Center. Um, it's one of the many hats I get to wear on campus, and one of those hats that I wear in addition to being the Director of the Women's Center is I'm one of three permanent members on the University Council on Gender Equity. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking with you all this afternoon about that. Um, I know we have a few folks in the room who have served on the UCGE in the past. Um, so the mission of the University Council on Gender Equity is to address gender inequities at LSU by leveraging the knowledge, expertise, and resources of council members to develop and revise policies, procedures, and protocols on campus. That's our website. We are situated under the Office of Diversity at LSU. A little bit of the history. In 1999, the Commission on the Status of Women forms. It meets on and off for the next several years, sort of as issues on campus arise to make policy recommendations, do research, et cetera. Um, between about 2006 and 2008, the CSW becomes the University Council on Women, and it's established as a standing body. And then in 2013, UCW changes its name to the University Council on Gender Equity, and then we establish the current mission that I just shared with all of you. Some of the major past initiatives that the Council and Commission have worked on include uh, the sexual assault policy, so drafting that original PM73 that we have on campus, uh, maternity and paternity leave, that's not something that's always existed here at the University, partner benefits, Child Independent Care Research and White Paper, that was one of the things that was really instrumental whenever a couple of years ago the Child Care Center was going to move from auxiliary services to being run by a private entity, but there were folks on campus who met, faculty senate, staff senate, again a lot of guidance from that white paper that was written by UCGE members and the determination was made 
to move it to the College of Human Sciences and Education. Uh, UCGE was instrumental in the stop the tenure clock policy that we have at the university, the dual career hire, and then most recently the faculty salary study where we shared that information last year. We looked at gender gaps in pay here at the university broken down by various colleges and I think that's now an initiative that faculty senate is kind of taking and looking at and working on addressing closing some of those gaps. Current initiatives that we are working on, uh, mentoring, so part of the current strategic plan that we're under, mentoring is a component of that. So we are working with academic affairs and HR to look at what does this look like on campus, how does this manifest, how do we meet the needs of faculty, staff, and potentially even students and supporting them through some sort of formalized mentoring program. We feel like we are pretty close on this one. Um, we have been charged with getting something in place by the end of the year, so be on the lookout for information about that. One of the new initiatives that we're going to be looking at is what, how do we support pregnant and parenting students, faculty, and staff on campus while we have maternity and paternity leave for professional employees on campus we don't have those same protections in place for students on campus. And so this has come up particularly with some graduate students. So uh, we're not fully in compliance with federal policy and laws around these types of things. So there's a, a group of us that are working again with OAA, with HR, to look at creating some new policies, policy revision around that. One of the other major issues that this initiative we'll be looking at is lactation spaces on campus. So we are required to have a minimum number of lactation spaces per X number thousand of women who are on campus. We are not at that number, so we are out of compliance there. So there's a group of us that's been meeting kind of informally doing a space assessment on campus in conjunction with facility services, individual departments and colleges. And so tomorrow we'll actually be meeting to see what spaces have been identified on campus, which ones are fully compliant with the federal regulations with what lactation spaces have to have, and then what will it take to get those other spaces to compliance, and then how do we disseminate that information. Sort of ironically enough, um, hopefully many of you in here have actually been to the Women's Center, we technically have a lactation space in the Women's Center. However, it does not meet the federal designation of a lactation space because it's in a bathroom, and lactation <coughs> spaces cannot be in bathrooms. Um, and then one of the um, other major initiatives is our closing the gaps. So this is something that we began in 2015, where we were looking at what are some gaps on campus within the community, and how can we convene experts that we have from our own ranks to address some of these issues and to explore them. That's been something that's been incredibly successful. I see lots of familiar faces here from folks who have attended those events in the past. Um, so I got a little breakdown of what we've done. Again, we launched December of 2015 with looking at leadership gaps on campus for women. Uh, that we did in exploring the leadership gap for women of color on campus, looking at women in STEM, after the 2016 election, we looked at the general political climate for women. Then uh, we've done exploring the climate for LGBTQ faculty, staff, and students. Last year, we kicked off our panel series with working toward holistic wellness and what does that mean. In November is whenever we presented our findings on the gender wage gap, um, which again, that information was shared with all of you. And then we ended with a Me Too at LSU. So looking at that contemporary movement and conversations that are happening nationally, locally, and globally. And how does that impact and play into what's happening here at LSU? And then in April, OAA came to us and said, we want to partner on a leadership symposium with Closing the Gaps. And so we brought Meg Umstutz onto campus. She's the interim president at Coastal Georgia. And she did um, a great talk on her leadership journey. OAA has committed to supporting that initiative again. And so we are working right now 
who that speaker is going to be in the fall. We're also working on looking at what topics we're going to be addressing this year through our Closing the Gaps panel series. Membership of UCGE, we typically have about 20 members representing faculty, staff, and students from across the A&M campus, so that makes us pretty unique in terms of whenever you look at bodies on, on campus to have representation across all of those ranks. Terms are three years, but maybe less for affiliated members, and I'll tell y'all a little bit about our affiliated members. And then the UCGE chair rotates between a faculty and a staff member. So Mandy Lopez was one of our co-chairs last year um, whenever it was the faculty rotation for UCGE. And then we strive to have a broadly diverse membership. So looking at diversity in very large terms and characteristics. So what departments are represented? What colleges are represented? Um, what ages? What genders of folks are represented? So it's not UCGE is all HHS folks and all student affairs folks. But how do we have diverse rep uh, representation from across campus? Um, so as we get lists of potential members, we look